Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Today's guest is Kurt McDaniel, Assistant State Conservationist for West Tennessee. Welcome, Kurt. Good morning, Scott. How are you doing? Fantastic. It's really great to have you here on Real Foot Forward. I'm um, really looking forward to talking with you a little bit about, about your life. Tell me, where, where were you born and where did you grow up? Born and raised in Rutherford, Tennessee, Gibson County, uh, just uh, south of Union City and where Discovery Park is located. Uh, just a little community called Good Luck that's uh, east of Rutherford, about five miles. Born and raised on a farm here. Uh, it's a century farm. I had the privilege and the luxury and just the benefit of being able to be um, raised and uh, grow up on a farm and get introduced to that agricultural lifestyle from a very early age. So are you uh, interested in genealogy and ancestry? Have you gone back to research the ancestors that actually built the, the barns and the, and the fields there? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, as part of the Century Farm Projects, um, we had to go back and trace that back, and it was just a, a, a unique experience to go back to the courthouse. You know, you heard these stories uh, passed down through generations, but to actually go back and map that out, uh, you know, my great-great-grandfather uh, bought our farm, first 100 acres, in 1913. And so we've been here ever since, right here in this community, um, farming, living on the land. Right now, uh, I live on a farm. You might It might sound a lot like a scene out of the Masters where they have the bird sounds church, uh, kind of uh, chimed in and, and, and funneled in, but I'm actually at the farm today uh, working uh, as we're in this kind of COVID-19 precautionary setup that we have going on with USDA right now. So yeah, just uh, uh, still live here. Uh, my mother is here, my brother and his wife and four kids are here. So we're all uh, right here in a uh, pretty close community right here in uh, Rutherford, Tennessee. So growing up, I assume that your uh, parents had you out uh, working the fields and learning about agriculture from an early age? Yeah, so uh, my dad described what he did was uh, pull himself up from his own bootstraps. Uh, and so this farm has been in our uh, family for um, a long time. Uh, but uh, my dad's dad passed away at an early age, at 50 years old. And so my dad was 17 at the time. And so a lot of the things that you would have uh, seen in a multi-generational operation really didn't happen the way that you would have thought it would. A lot of time you would have thought knowledge would have been able to pass down that type of thing. So my dad kind of had to strike out on his own and find his own way forward and he, he did that quite successfully along with my mom and yeah we were a, a typical family farm. Uh, we uh, did it all very collectively uh, and very internally. Obviously we had people that helped us but uh, I, at a very young age, had um, responsibilities, tasks, chores, and things now that I look back on, and I know a lot of people in West Tennessee do this, look back on and say, wow, it was a struggle at the time, uh, but it's prepared me for a lot of things going forward. A lot of times in my job now, my professional job, I'm able to describe to people responsibilities and ownership for um, tasks that had to get done. Uh, that you need to be a self-starter, you need to have a little bit of initiative, and you need to have be able to do it with a little supervision. And I think a lot of people that you'll talk to in the ag community and around West Tennessee have, have been benefited by that that childhood and being raised up that way. So yes, I think uh, my brother and I were talking about the other day, I think I was on my first tractor at 11 years old independently. Uh, I know my brother, who's two years younger than me, actually was uh, a a little more ambitious. He was doing a lot of things younger because we just needed it. Uh, and I think my dad uh, looked at that as an opportunity to teach us, uh, but he also looked at it as an opportunity that he needed to help. So very, very grateful for those experiences growing up. What, what did you farm uh, when y'all were growing up? So we uh, had uh, started off row crops, so corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton, uh, then, but we also had other, you know, really diversification. My dad, uh, we had pasture land as well. Um, my dad was a hog farmer. And so we grew up, um, my dad uh, called it hog farming. I mean, we did the row crop and the other stuff kind of as a supplement to that. Uh, but it was a very 
a well-defined, diversified well, uh, working farm. And so uh, I can still remember, um, you know, uh, chopping cotton. I can still remember marking pigs for vaccination. Uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of agriculture happening at one spot with a lot of things to do. And so a lot of responsibility at a very young age. So you've obviously seen a lot of uh, uh, innovation and changes in the agriculture industry from the time you were 11 years old on a tractor to today. I'm sure your tractor today is a lot different than the one from when you were 11. Uh, speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of change and change for the good. Uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, what we'll get to talking about today is I'm a conservationist. That's what I do uh, with my professional life. But I learned the foundations for what I do now um, as a conservationist from my time on the farm. Uh, and I think one of the biggest changes that we saw was and have seen in technology is just the ability to produce more on one acre of land than we did uh, previously. You know, so when we look at in the mid 80s and up and through the 90s, when I was really on the farm, uh, we looked at, you know, what kind of labor intensive practices that we were pouring into that and then what kind of yield we were getting from, as a result of that. And I think now what you've seen is the, the labor and mechan me mechanical part of that has kind of downsized, but we've increased the ability to make a uh, acre productive. And I think that's the biggest thing and the biggest change that I've seen uh, in, in my career in ag, uh, growing up on a farm and now being in the professional side of it from a conservation standpoint is just, uh, we're doing less and getting more off an acre of land. So let's, let's back up to uh, you were with the high school and the time came for you to decide which path to take in life. Uh, what were what was going through your head? What what did you consider, and how and what what path did you end up taking? Well, um, you know, uh, I wanted to farm. I think uh, you know, talking to my mom, uh, which is which is just a cornerstone of our operation and our and our family currently. Is talking to her and going back through old pictures and kind of just uh, as we I celebrated her birthday not long too too long ago. When we were going back over some old pictures and things and looking. And we just, uh, my brother and I just emulated our father from the, from day one, his boots and car hearts. Uh, and we wanted to go everywhere he went and we didn't get to do that. We were uh, upset and uh, a fit, but uh, we basically, I wanted to farm. And so I grew up with that. Um, I grew up with that, that intent. My dad told me, he said, you're not going to come back and farm until you've got a college degree. And so, um, you know, I went to, um, I went to college at University of Tennessee, Martin, and that's really where I fell into uh, uh, really being passionate about agriculture and learning more about that. Uh, and obviously um, getting around a group in that agriculture school over there at Brim and being engaged with that community really l lifted my excitement about that career. Uh, I farmed with my, my dad and my brother uh, my last two years of college. Uh, and actually, you know, we had um, really worked to kind of upgrade We'd moved, you know, when you talk about technological advances, we'd moved up to, you know, from the six row and eight row equipment up to 12 row and really had took a, a, a bite into that expansion. Uh, sometime in that uh, area, my, my, my dad just a real assessment of things and looked at things and this is what I really want to do. Uh, you know, I've, I've we've had a good life here, but is it what can I I want to continue doing this and do I want to bring my sons into doing that so we all sat down kind of talked about what the future was for McDaniel Farms and kind of decided that look we're going to try to um, you know kind of put a pin in things pause things folks you and, and it told me he said you don't need to anticipate coming back to this I'm not sure what the future is so well, I was just about to graduate school at Martin and what does a person do when they don't have a job coming out of college? They go to grad school. And I say that jokingly, but I didn't have any other options. So I said, I want to know what I can do as far as further my career. So I went to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, and at that point, uh, around 2000, at that point, precision agriculture was uh, really big and becoming a very uh, a very hot topic and so I went to University of Tennessee at Knoxville and got my master's in um, biosystems engineering at that point it was um, uh, soil science and uh, engineering technology uh, they since changed the name of that and I studied uh, how do we utilize technology to uh, determine variation in yields across fields 
and how do we utilize that technology to make us more efficient and more productive? Uh, and it was an uh, opportunity that shed a lot of light for me in getting to know how this equipment is running as far as yield monitors and variable rate application, and how do we look at uh, assessing variables across fields that may differ, and how do we change our inputs across those fields in order to be efficient from a economy standpoint and also from a production standpoint. So got done at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, came out, uh, got went into the private industry, and then uh, spent a little bit of time in that. And then USDA had some job openings for conservationists back in West Tennessee. Now, I'll tell you, I entered into the private world. I went to Mississippi. Uh, and uh, I got down there, and let me tell you, I missed West Tennessee. I missed home. Like a lot of people that I know uh, can uh, uh, sympathize with that, but I wanted to get back home. And USDA offered up uh, entry-level jobs into their uh, conservation uh, roles, and I was lucky enough to get a position there and was able to move back, uh, move back from there. So, so it, it sounds like you made the best of – you know, the detour that happened, was it at the time as easy as just changing gears or was it, I mean, you had been planning on doing this, going back home and working on your family's farm. Was it, you know, did you have any pause before you jumped right back into a different direction? Uh, no, I really didn't have the time, but I knew that I was going, it was going to be something that I was still going to be involved with. It wasn't like it, somebody took it away from you. It was just like, this is not going to be your full-time uh, career. This is not going to be um, uh, what you come back and do and, and do for the next 40 years. Uh, and I think my dad had a lot of foresight in that. Uh, I think my dad was um, very shrewd in, in, in how he forecasted for the future and how he made a successful farming operation for 30 years. And I think he looked at that and looked at what was upcoming and said, do I really want to, uh, you know, do I really want to continue this? Uh, and do I want to bring in somebody – uh, additionally to that, uh, and just there was other obstacles and hurdles in the way as well as far as health and some other things. Uh, but no, I think it was um, I think it was um, something that was very um, easy for me to shift into. I, th I told my, my professors at Martin is that if I couldn't farm, the next best thing I wanted to do was help farmers and help landowners. And if I couldn't do it myself, I wanted to help people. Uh, be able to do it uh, better uh, and be able to support them and advise them and give them counsel. I didn't know what capacity that would be in, whether it would be in the technology field. How do you, uh, how do you set up your yield monitor? How do you utilize the data coming out of that? Little did I know that it would actually be in counseling and guiding and advising uh, producers and landowners on how to conserve their natural resources, uh, which uh, was just a real easy transition for me to make because I had experienced so much of that effort on our own farm uh, and it was something that I'm passionate about and something that really was easily for me to carry over and do that. So a lot of folks listening um, are from all over the place. They've never even met a farmer before and they know very little about how their food, fuel and fiber gets from the farm to the family. Um, why don't you share a little bit about how conservation and agriculture intersect and what is it specifically that you're trying to help farmers learn how to do? Yeah, so um, what, we, what I try to do is explain what a conservationist is. And a farmer, I think that you have your, um, you could look up a definition of a farmer in the Webster Dictionary, and most people who are listening to this are going to know what that looks like. I could ask them to tell me what they think a conservationist looks like, uh, and people are not going to have much of an idea how to uh, draw that. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, um, uh, of people out there that, that are unaware of what a conservationist is. And so I, t I have, and I tell this, and I, it's a joke between our, in our, inside of our agency, is that most of your families don't even know what you do when you go to work every day. And I've told this joke a lot of times. My mom still doesn't know how to describe to a church group what it is that I do. I think one day she tried to describe to me how she relayed to them what I do, and she said he's saving the earth one dirt clot at a time. And so uh, I hate to put it that simple, but it, we're, what we try to do is, from a conservation standpoint on production agriculture lands, is we're trying to protect, enhance, and restore soil, water, plants, and animals and the ability for that land to be as productive as possible. 
uh, and that's what we do. We're trying to uh, we're trying to implement practices, whether that be vegetative practices such as you know uh, cropland conversion to pasture and or tree planting, or whether that be vegetative or management practices such as cover cropping or maybe managing the residue on that farm a little differently, all the way up to what our bread and butter is in West Tennessee, our structural practices where we actually prevent uh, water from creating gullies and washing. The term that you'll hear most often on every farm is uh, washing. Water that concentrates and takes soil with it and, and, and ha wreaks havoc, creates erosion. We're trying to protect that. And so um, all of it is a real systematic approach. All of those things that I talked about, soil, water, your plants and your animals, and ultimately wildlife and energy and other uh, resource concerns that we're entering into, such as air quality, all kind of relatively work together. And so what we're looking at is trying to incorporate systems, management systems, land management systems on farms that allow for that to be protected uh, in some cases allows for that to be enhanced above where it is right now and in some cases allows us to go back in time and restore to where it previously was. And so that's really the three key uh, definitions about conservation is protecting something, enhancing it, or restoring it back to where it was. And that's what we try to do. Uh, that's what we try to do with landowners and producers in West Tennessee. I was actually, um, you know, people like me who are not farmers or don't know anything about agriculture probably don't understand all that goes into managing um, fields. And I was flipping through a book that was like from the 1950s on the TVA project and how, you know, what the land was like before that here in the gullies. And um, I mean, it can be devastating uh, to a farmer back then, especially before they knew how to manage that. Yeah. So um, I'm, uh, I'm the assistant state conservationist for uh, field operations in West Tennessee. So I have 21 counties under my supervision, uh, 18 different USDA offices, uh, and we're called the Natural Resources Conservation Service. That's our name. And if you, you really know, it's a long name. And I'm going to try to avoid acronyms as much as possible today because I know it's a complete ac acronym alphabet soup when I do that. But I want to go back to the what started our agency. So our agency has kind of seen some progression in our names. We're now NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We previously were the Soil Conservation Service, SES, and then before that we were Soil Erosion Service. But the roots of our agency and what was created was um, the impacts that we were seeing from uh, production methods uh, back in the 30s. Uh, that was leading to a basically a disaster or a uh, natural disaster for our country. Uh, the Dust Bowl was really the um, what initialized and started our agency. Is that uh, it came out a result of what we were seeing uh, with the Dust Bowl, and you've heard about you've seen the, the the TVA project, but also if you go back in time, there's a lot of um, a lot of different stories about that. Uh, there's a book out there called The Worst Hard Times. It talks about that. Uh, and it's really what started our agency was to we needed people on the ground that understood science, but also could balance that with what was needing to be done from a production standpoint and go to people and say, I can help you prevent this from happening, but also maintain your ability to produce. And so our agency was created to get people out on the ground. We call it boots on the ground. We call it getting people out on fields, on farms, in trucks, in tractors, in farm offices, in shops, and having a conversation with you about uh, what it is that, um, that you're seeing that's um, an issue and then how and what alternatives we can provide you to address that and mitigate that. And so our, our agency was started over 80 years ago. Uh, and we've been doing that ever since, and uh, we've been doing it across the country. So what, what, uh, what's an example of you go into, you know, say, say I decided to start farming, um, and it'd probably take me three years before I could even get, get anything happening, but let's just <laughs> assume that I did. What, talk me through uh, how our relationship grows and what happens. Yeah, so, you know, what we – try to do we want to make sure people know and I want to make sure our, our listeners know and our audiences know is that 
we are um, an opportunity and avenue for assistance. That's our number one goal is that we want to provide solutions to you uh, to balance natural resources and production on your farm. We want to we want to have a conversation. And I think that's the biggest takeaway is that it would start by um, you knowing that our uh, our information is out there and that you know that our offices are out there. So anybody in the country can uh, Google search USDA Service Center and pull up the county that they're living in or have farmland in or have land in general. We're not just limited to strictly ag production. We're across all land management systems and all types of systems that are applied on land. And I would encourage them to look at their county and it tells them exactly where the USDA Service Center is located. Uh, you Google that, you pull up your county, and then automatically it pulls up and then it gives you the people to contact. And so USDA is not just limited to natural resources conservation, we also have the Farm Service Agency. And I think uh, that you had some of those folks back at Discovery Park in your Ag Literacy Week uh, where we're actually under a um, mission area under USDA called uh, Farm and Production and Conservation Area, uh, FPAC, uh, Farm Production Conservation Area, which is farm conservation and production all together. How do we balance those two things? And our agencies that we have in our USDA field offices is Farm Service Agency as well. So it gives you contacts for both of those folks you know how to walk into an office. We encourage people just to walk in and start a dialogue. And so with uh, we have, uh, you know, many people that in that hypothesis, in that situation, and then we say, okay, let's start by looking at what's the definition of your um, operation, what land uses, uh, and then ultimately it's about what you want to achieve, Scott. So if you came to us and if we would want to know before we could actually work uh, through a plan, a conservation plan for you, was to know what you want to achieve. Is it row crop production? Is it vegetable crop production? Is it cattle production and livestock production? confined animal feeding operation, um, the, or do you concentrate on wildlife on your farm? And so there's a lot of different avenues that we can provide options on, um, depending on your objectives. Our main uh, decision point hinges off of what you as a producer and a land manager and a landowner want to accomplish on your land. Can you think of any uh, success stories that pop in your head when you think of the work you've been doing with farmers? Oh yeah, well, I mean, uh, the most successful thing that you can hear, and this is in general, is that uh, we get this feedback quite often. Is that I couldn't, have, I wouldn't have been able to do this without you. And I think that's what uh, you know. Our, we have a very passionate and very knowledgeable, uh, and, and 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 just hardworking group of people that work for USDA in general and for NRCS and for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So, uh, just a very dedicated group to uh, a passion for conservation. Uh, a passion for public service ethic and, and just some of the hardest working people that you would see. And I think uh, when we talk about success stories, we want to talk about those situations where it was beneficial for, I would call it a, a trifecta of, benef of benefits is that number one, it was beneficial, ben beneficial for our customer. Number two, it was beneficial for the taxpayer. Ultimately as USDA employee, we're all um, paid by, uh, our tax paying public who uh, tells Congress that conservation is important, voluntary conservation is important. And so we're going to put things in place that, um, and, and we're going to put people out there to deliver it. And then if it's beneficial to society, that's number two. And ultimately we want it to be beneficial for our own agency. And so if we hit those three things, if we, if it, if it, the customer is saying, yes, this is positive for me. If, society says yes this is resulting in cleaner water uh and and, and better wildlife and less uh, soil erosion then that's a, a, a feather in our hat as well and then ultimately we want our agency to say yes it was worth our time and our money to accomplish those things and so that's what we're looking for as far as success um success in west tennessee uh we are right now in a better place from a conservation standpoint than we've ever been uh, and so I'll, that's a tremendous success story. Success story. Um, so I want to back up for just a second, and I want to talk kind of about the model of how we deliver that. Partnership is a big word in our agency and in our conservation community because we can't do 
as much alone as we can together. And we all know that. So uh, when the agency was formed in partnership with that and in parallel with that was a soil conservation district style of local delivery of conservation. So uh, each state uh, set up a uh, state soils committee that was charged with trying to get a group of local individuals in each county to uh, be a board to drive the direction of how they were going to improve soil and water conservation in each of the counties. And that happened across the country. Uh, and West Tennessee uh, established some of the first of those districts. And so each county in West Tennessee has a set of uh, board members that direct the local efforts of the conservation um, delivery system in that county in partnership with USDA and NRCS and so we're looking at how do we uh, how do we partner with them to establish those local uh, locally led priorities and then how do we help them deliver those so when you talk about success you want to talk a tremendous success in West Tennessee one of the most erosive places in the world has been with the partnership between uh, USDA and with those soil conservation boards and each county in West Tennessee has one made up of five members uh, that are appointed and elected to make sure that the delivery of uh, voluntary conservation is being delivered in those in those counties. And so tremendous success there. And I could I would take me a second or two to think about more specific success stories, but you know, in general, you could go and you talk to these boards and they meet monthly. Uh, most of them do meet monthly. Uh, definitely regularly scheduled meetings and they talk about history a lot of the times where, where we're at. Uh, at one point in West Tennessee, uh, the county road departments had to have road graders that would remove soil from roads from erosion. And so a lot of the times that's a very visceral um, example. I mean, I, I've sat through several board members uh, meetings where they have said, man, can you believe 40 years ago, 50 years ago, after a rain event, you would have to take uh, the road grader out and scrape the roads clear of the soil that had um, deposited from the ag fields onto there. So we don't see that any anymore. Uh, and so when I say that we were as far along in the conservation movement as we've ever been, I mean, it's quite literal uh, that it's very visual that, we're, uh, that we've come a long ways. And so the conservation ethic that is... Uh, being, you know, implemented by our producers and land managers, and then the conservation community is um, is is a success in itself. You, you don't you don't have to dig very long into West Tennessee and agriculture and conservation before you run across the whole topic of no-till farming. Um, I, I, why don't you speak a little bit because I find that whole story so fascinating um about the differences and now that's just about the only thing i know about agriculture is i can tell when somebody's no-till farming and and when they're tilling yeah so uh the no-till has its roots right here in west tennessee you know you talk about um from a historical and a cultural place in the world uh well our nation especially is that west tennessee holds a special place in the conservation community uh, because uh, no-till was started right here in west tennessee I mean, you had the Milan No-Till Experiment Station, which hosted its annual No-Till Day, fourth Thursday of, uh, of every July for years. That was the highlight of my summer. I was 20 miles from Milan. Uh, the highlight of our summer was to go to uh, the concert the day before, the Wednesday before the, um, the No-Till Day, and then it was to jump in the truck and go with our dad and get us a packet that we walked around to each of those vendors and, and maybe get a sticker, maybe get a measuring stick, uh, you know, maybe get a pack of chewing tobacco, just, uh, you know, one of the highlights of a kid uh, growing up in West Tennessee. But that, while we were having those funds as kids, there was producers there in the thousands that were learning how do I better manage and how can I uh, better manage my farms to be more resilient? How can I be a better steward? But also, how can I continue to improve my profits and my production? And, uh, and so that you just I don't think you can put a price tag on the amount of benefits that that place had and that time had for all of West Tennessee. <laughs> and, and that we, was uh, uh, Bob McCutcheon. Is that how you say his name? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He started that. So, so he was really a lot of people. He introduced this idea 
um, and really was a champion of it all the way up until he passed away. Um, and that really spread out from West Tennessee all over the country. Yeah, it sure did. I mean, the people from all over the country and other countries came to this no-till day. And it, you ha and it wasn't just it wasn't just located right there on Milan. It was, but it also splintered out to other farms. And they had uh, you know uh, exhibition farms all over West Tennessee showing how this was done. So it was really adopted quite um, quite um, quick by our producers. Um, and then you could evidently you could see the the benefits of it very quickly. And for those who don't know, can you describe a little bit about uh, how people were farming before that was introduced and, and what impact that made? Well, it was just a very intensive um, management, uh, uh, the intensive management of uh, soil movement and manipulation. And, and I grew up uh, on a farm that uh, was utilizing that. I mean, when I first grew up, when I was growing up, we needed the help because we were making so many passes over a farm. Uh, I quite literally, I know that you might uh, make four and five passes with implements over a piece of land in order to prep it for planting. And, um, you know, I, I, I spent many hours doing that. And that's just how you did it. I mean, it's just, uh, there's no, at that point, that's just how uh, you had to make a living and that's how you did it. Uh, I think farms were smaller in those times and uh, they were more focused and more targeted. But then, the, the implementation of the farm bills as well. So 1985 uh, started the farm bills where we uh, tied conservation with uh, program payments from USDA. Uh, and so I think that's where you saw uh, that combined with the educational uh, efforts of many colleges highlighted and spearheaded by University of Tennessee Extension and what was going on at Milan. I think that's where you started to see the change. And also just the need to do it. Um, you know, we, we were moving in a time in that place where we were just going to, we didn't know it yet, but we were going to see um, things that weren't going to be very conducive for multiple passes over fields. And so the less passes you can make, the more uh, money that you, you the saved from, uh, in, you know, putting that crop in ultimately uh, impacted your bottom dollar. So I think that's the, I think it was a perfect storm from all those things coming together uh, of what we saw. Uh, but I think uh, it allowed our producers to manage more land as well. So it's kind of facilitated our increase in production of utilizing these conservation management systems. Um, so as you know, we're working on an agriculture exhibit uh, on innovation and agriculture here at Discovery Park of America. So we've been doing a lot of work on uh, pollinators and and I'm fast. I've become I've become fascinated with bees and with monarch butterflies. Can you? I know that you've done a little bit of work in that area. Can you talk a little bit about um, that whole area of agriculture? Yeah. So it's one of the most exciting areas I think in arenas that we've seen in a long time. You know, no-till was exciting, and that was you know we, you would uh, hear phrases. And I want to jump back on that just for a second. Kind of set the stage for this new arena that we're in but you kind of heard uh comments as you would ride down the road and that the uh, uh stores for lunch is that why is it hey, can you believe what that guy's doing planting through that can you believe what that guy's doing doing that can't can't believe that uh, and so there's a lot of excitement and a lot of talk about it and a lot of publicity on it and i think now what we're seeing in the uh, monarch and pollinator arena is a a lot of um, publicity on that too and I think uh, one of the things to talk about monarchs and pollinators is that, is that they're a needle for the ecosystem of our whole country. Uh, if you look at the, um, if you look at how a monarch gets from one spot in the world to another spot in the world and how many iterations of a life it takes to do that, it's quite remarkable. You start uh, in Mexico and then you end up in Canada and that takes three or four or five months and then you take and you reverse that back again so that you end up back in Mexico. And I think when I say it's a uh, basically a, 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 a way to monitor our ecosystem is that along that path there has to be a lot of habitat in order to sustain that, that uh, basically round trip. And I think what we're seeing is that um, a lot of interest in that because we're seeing a precipitous decline. 
And so if we're seeing a 90% decline in the monarch habitats or no monarch populations in the world, when you talk about Mexico and the United States and Canada, North America, then there's got to be some, um, I guess, uh, alarm raised about what is the habitat along that corridor that's making for this. And I think that's what you've seen from a public standpoint and a lot of interest in is that it's a, it's, it's, um, I had friends in Missouri when I was there and worked there is that uh, they, they called it the, almost like the bald eagle because I mean, a monarch to a lot of uh, people is a very distinct animal. It's a very distinct, um, uh, you can, when you say monarch, you can visualize what a monarch is and it's a very uh, indicative uh, species of our, how we're doing right now on the land. And so I think what you've seen is a real, uh, a real enthusiasm for protecting it and pollinators as well. So, I mean, uh, pollinators are a real um, indicative species of what's going on on the landscape. If you see them, it, you're probably got a lot of diversity. If you don't see them and what we, it's critical for uh, pollination of our crops. If you don't see them, there may be some habitat issues that we need to identify. And I think what you've seen is <coughs> just a, um, a big uh, push for how do we uh, get those on the landscape and how do we show that, um, that they are beneficial not only to uh, production on farms, but also to just ecosystems and health and then to the public awareness of how we're doing things. Um, there, it's, a, it's a big arena that we're in right now and we're very much uh, a part of that. And we want uh, one of the biggest pr uh, practices that we did last year uh, was put in monarch habitat. Uh, we uh, put in substantial amount uh, and caught and actually provided financial assistance to do that. So what? Um, so we have at Discovery Park. You know, we're putting our ag exhibit um, in um, our big uh, Simmons Bank Ag Center, and then we have a lot of uh, grassy space in front of it that we're going to put in some kind of plants and habitat. Uh, what what do you recommend for people like like us or if I was a farmer, you know, what what should I be doing to contribute to that? Yeah, so uh, it's called native species and basically we want to mimic mother nature uh, and back before we all got here and in this place was uh, what we called native grass prairies uh, and a lot of the Midwest uh, was uh, native grasses, which was diverse forbs, uh, diverse grasses that um, really they would uh, uh, bloom at different times of the year. So you'd have blooming in spring, you'd have blooming in summer, and you'd have blooming in late fall, which provided a real uh, good coverage for a home for those uh, beneficial uh, insects uh, along a, a lot of time. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at uh, what was it before I got here and we converted it either it got converted it, it, it just successionalized to trees or we're cropping it now we've got to go back and mimic that so we've got um, you know plenty you can you can google that too is that what does a good pollinator mix look like but you want something that offers forbs and grasses and that blooms at different times and so um, and I'll, I, I, Scott just a plug here but we can we can help with uh, with something that would be a mix for help you see that's ideally what that you just posed the question that we would love to hear come into the office is that somebody wants and has an objective of more pollinators on their land how do I get that we are the people that can provide you with the answers on how to do that that's great our friends over at Nutrien are going to work and help us get our soil uh, healthier yeah. Uh, for yep. that kind of thing. So we'll absolutely connect our team here um, with you to figure out exactly what that needs to look like because we want it to be educational as well. We want people to be able to walk through and learn things that they can then be inspired to go home and do the same kind of thing in their own property in whatever way that makes sense. And it's very easy to do. Uh, I mean, we, we have that most of our career days and boost, we have a little a gallon bag, a gallon bag, Ziploc bag of seed that you can put into a, 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 a raised bed at your home, uh, put into a flower pot, put into a little garden, uh, and you can see results from it immediately. Uh, you can see uh, it doesn't take long. It's almost like the, oh, uh, you know, the, uh, it's the field of dreams analogy. You build it and they'll come. I mean, it's going to, it doesn't take that long uh, to see uh, benefits from that. 
Well, that's excellent. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing more about that with you as we prepare this, this exhibit. I think it's going to be really exciting. And a lot of what you've talked about is what we're going to be talking about in, in museum speak when we have exhibits and when we, when we open it later this year. So I'm really yeah. excited. Well, we're really excited about that too. And I just want to say what, uh, you know, Discovery Park, what it's offered to West Tennessee is very impressive. I mean, we, um, uh, we see a lot of people that come uh, through the area for conservation tours and other things. And Discovery Park is always something that we point out. It's brought a lot of benefits to the people of West Tennessee, and it's bringing more people there. I mean, I've had an opportunity to go through it. And, you know, I am a history buff. We talked about that earlier. <clears throat> Just a lot of history. And uh, we want to make sure that ag is a uh, part of that. And however we can contribute that, we want to. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me a little bit of time today uh, to be yeah, here. Absolutely. Just, uh, I would uh, say, uh, it's just kind of a take home message is that we've got uh, programs out there that help people, not just from a technical assistance standpoint, but a financial assistance standpoint, uh, that we can offset some of the costs to implement some of these practices that we've talked about today. If you have a problem in your farm, if you have uh, a gully that's formed, uh, if you have uh, compaction issues, if you have residue management issues, if you have want to grow better grass, want to grow better livestock, if you have wildlife concerns or if you have energy concerns or air quality concerns uh, on your farms, please do not hesitate to come by and see us. We have a whole range of ways that we can deliver those practices onto your farms and, and a lot of times offset that with financial assistance. Uh, we have a rewards program that's open right now. It's called the Conservation Stewardship Program. That application period is up till June 1st, uh, and it's the chance for you to get credit for all the good things that you've been doing on your farms. And, Scott, we've talked about this today, and you asked for successes, and, and maybe the next conversation we have, we can dive into specific examples of that. But we have a tremendous success story to tell in West Tennessee. Our conservation story uh, is tremendous in the impacts that we have given to um, to uh, communities, not just our agricultural production community, but our communities in general. And I, I want people to know that, and we need to talk more about that and get that out there in the conscious of people to know that when you see these tractors going over these fields planting, you see sprayers planting, or you meet them in the road, not only are they putting food on the table, but they're also doing it in a very sustainable and stewardship friendly manner that contributes to better water quality, uh, contributes to less soil uh, entering into rivers and streams, and ultimately the Gulf is providing more wildlife habitat, and they're all doing that um, uh, for us. And so I want to say thank you to uh, all of those folks out there that are implementing those practices and work with us. And I want to say, um, please come in if you're not working with us. Uh, it, it Rome wasn't built in a day. We can take it uh, a bite at a time. And uh, we'd just love to have a dialogue with you and, and discuss what the options are on your farm. So thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. And what would be the best way for me if I were a farmer to be able to connect with you to get more information on that? We haven't talked about it, but I mean, one of the reasons why we're doing this here today and the Zoom uh, audio and re video recording is because we're – our operational status is really different right now than it was five weeks ago. And so right now, the best way is to call our offices for an appointment. Um, we're not allowing uh, customers into the office just from the precautions that USDA wants to make sure that we uh, prevent any spread of COVID-19 to our customers. And it's also a preventive measure for our staff right now operating uh, in this um uh, a structure to limit uh, the spread of this. It's very unprecedented, unparalleled times. We want to make sure uh, that we are providing uh, safety um, precautions for our customers and our staff, but we're still open for business. We're still taking telephone calls. Uh, we want to let you know that we're there to help you. There's Just because we're in this situation doesn't mean the producers, agriculturalists, land managers don't have to stop managing their land and producing for us. And so we want to make sure they know we're there. So I would go back to what I mentioned earlier, The um, just go to Google search, uh, USDA Service Center Locator. And in there, you can type in the county you're in, the state and the county you're in, and it will provide the numbers that you could call to get a hold of somebody at offices right now. We do still have people there. We're rotating in and out, balancing 
uh, and social distancing uh, from our staff's perspective, but we do have people there. We can get appointments made. We can begin to think about what's the path for you to identify your conservation objectives and what is the delivery of alternatives to address those and then how do we help you step by step get that implemented on your farm. This is Scott Williams, president of Discovery Park of America. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.